Dude, I'm so sorry, dude. I'm sorry it took me so long to get this video out. I know, like, the first AP Chem exam is coming on May 7th, so I know this is kind of late. I'm sorry. But I've been really busy, okay? So I finally made the time to do it. These videos take a really long time to make, but I'm, I'm doing it, okay? I'm sorry. We are finally going to finish AP Chem. Better late than never, am I right? <laughs> that, that is my motto, okay? Hello everybody, I'm Kara, and today we are going to be talking about Acids and Bases, Unit 8, okay? We're only two units away from finishing the whole AP Chem chat, like, the whole AP Chemistry course. And the reason I didn't finish 8 and 9 beforehand is because, like, last year they didn't, they just took out these units because of, like, COVID and that kind of thing. And I really didn't get the time to get back into AP Chem because I'm not studying for AP Chem, like, I mean, it's been a really long time since I've been in AP Chem, and the, like, prep for these videos take a really, really long time, so I really haven't gotten around to it, but now... We are going to talk about all this cool stuff. Intro to acids and bases, pH, POH, all that cool stuff. You guys love all that stuff. I know you guys do. But because you guys have left such nice comments on all the other videos, you guys were begging me for more, and a ton of you guys watched my crash courses, that's why I'm making these videos, okay? So, thank you guys. But enough talking, let's get into the good stuff. Let's do it. Alright, so the first thing we're going to talk about is what are acids and bases? And basically, the most basic definition of an acid and a base was come up with this dude called Arrhenius, okay? He was actually French or something, I don't even know how to say his <laughs> name in a French accent, I'm not even gonna try, dude. But basically, this is what people learn when they think about acids and bases, right? Like, acids are the dudes who give off H plus ions. And basically, these H plus ions are called hydrogen ions. They might also be called protons, whatever, but basically, acids give off these guys, right? You probably know this already, but that's the most basic definition of an acid. Then, bases, they give off, guess what? That's right, OH minus, okay? And these ions are called hydroxide, right? Like hydrogen and oxygen. So, makes sense, makes sense, okay? <laughs> and that's basically it. We're done with the unit. We know what acids and bases are. Let's go. No, I'm kidding, but this is very important. Make sure you know the Arrhenius definition. It's just the most basic one. Another thing to note is that H plus ions, you probably have heard that, like, they turn into H3O plus ions and that, like, these are basically the same thing. They're basically the same thing, okay? So, honestly, I would not worry too much about H3O plus, but just know that it exists, okay? And it's called a hydronium ion. But essentially, you could use H+, and H3O+, like, interchangeably, and I always use H+, so, like, who cares about this, dude? This guy sucks. Okay. Okay, so basically, now that we know what Arrhenius, acids, and bases are, we could talk about neutralization reactions. And you probably could guess that neutralization means that the acid and the base, you put them together, you don't get a pineapple pen, you get a not <laughs> acid or base, right? It cancels out. So essentially, if we have, like, HCl, which is hydrochloric acid, plus NaOH, we could think about it this way, right? Like... Essentially, the H, you get like H plus, Cl minus, Na plus, and OH minus. How could we rearrange this to make something nice? That's right. We basically have the OH minus and the H plus come together to get H2O. And then we get NaCl, right? So essentially, you can see, we started with an acid and a base, right? But then we ended up with water and a salt. So that's basically the definition of a neutralization re reaction, right? Like you have an Arrhenius base that gives off an H plus. The H plus... Uh, combined with the OH minus given by the Arrhenius base, and that gives you water, and then the remaining stuff just forms a salt. And basically all a salt is is just a combination of ions, right? And Na plus and Cl minus are ions, so that's how why it's called a salt. Acid, this is the base, this is water, and that's a salt. Now something cool that not many people realize is if you do the net ionic equation, all neutralization reactions have the same net ionic equation. So let us just do it out. I kind of had it before, but we could do like H plus plus Cl minus plus NaO, Na plus plus OH minus. And then we go to H2O, right? Because it's liquid, it doesn't dissociate, right? There's a liquid and there's aqueous, right? Because it's dissolved in water. Plus Na plus plus Cl minus. We cancel out the Na plus, the Cl minus, and we get H plus plus OH minus yields H2O. And this is literally what it is for every single neutralization reaction. There's not a single neutralization reaction that does not have this equation. And it makes sense, right? The H plus is an acid, the OH minus is a um, hydroxide ion, and then they combine to form water. Right? H plus neutralizes with OH minus, that's why it's called a neutralization reaction. Okay, so now that we basically have an idea of what an acid is, what a base is, and what happens if you react them, now we can talk about what pH is, right? And you guys probably know that pH is, like, a measure of how acidic or basic something is, right? <laughs> like, you probably had it ingrained in your head that pH less than 7 means acidic, right? pH equal to 7 is equal to neutral. And pH is greater than 7 is basic. So now, let us take this thing that you probably know and, like, combine it with the molecular part of it, okay? 
So literally, the way I like to think about it is like, you got a P, you got an H, right? And the P could probably be like percent or something, like something to do with like the concentration of H. So essentially from that, you could tell that the definition is pH is equal to negative log of the concentration of H+. Now, this equation kind of looks scary. I mean, hopefully it doesn't look scary in just a couple lines, but like, still, it's kind of annoying. So let us just do a couple examples and hopefully it'll be more clear. So essentially, let us say that your concentration of H plus ions, which is basically the moles of H plus over the total like volume of the solution in liters, right? Because you know that like um, concentration is in moles per liter. Then essentially, if it was 10 to the negative 5, right? We would take the log 10 of this, which gives us a negative 5, and then we take the negative of that. So that means that this is pH 5. So essentially, the way you could just think about it is you're taking, you just ignore the 10, you look at the thing, and you take the negative of it. Because, like, pH is supposed to be positive, right? So basically, that, that's how you do it. Just smash that exponent and make it positive, and you got the pH. Okay, another example, right? Like, let's just say we had, like, H plus is, like, I don't know, 10 to the negative 9. I don't know. So you take the exponent, you make it a positive, you get pH is equal to like 9. Okay, then what happens if we don't have a nice power of 10? That is the question. What happens if we have like 2 to the negative 9 or something? I don't know. No, but what about like 2 times 10 to the negative 9 so that it is in scientific notation? <laughs> and now you might be expecting, what is the cool trick that Karara is going to show us now? That's right, I'm not going to show you a cool trick. Just kidding, I'm going to show you the coolest trick in the book, okay? Use a calculator, that's right! <laughs> Bruh. So essentially you just plug in the formula, like it's not that complicated, 2 times 10 to the negative 9. And you get 8.70. So let us put that in. Okay, so what do we see about the trend here, right? So essentially, as your hydrogen ion concentration is getting less, right? Like, 10 to the negative 5 is way bigger than 10 to the negative 9, right? Your pH is going up, right? Even though your, like, concentration of like hydrogen is going down, your pH goes up. So it's basically the opposite. And this makes sense, right? Like acid have more hydrogen ions, but they have the lowest pH. So essentially that's why there's a negative here. Because when you go down in hydrogen ion concentration, you want to actually go up in pH. And that also makes sense between these two, right? Like we're going from 10 to the negative nine, we're doubling the amount of hydrogen ions, right? And that's why it is slightly uh, less pH, right? Because you have more hydrogen ions, more acidic means less pH. Okay. So now we have this epic equation for pH. pH is equal to the negative log of H+. plus. You guys better know this. This is very important. But then there is also pOH, right? And what do you expect, right? It's literally like the same thing as pH, except now you got OH. So instead of putting an H+, plus, we put uh, OH-. minus. Very epic stuff. Okay. So the one thing you got to know about pH and pOH is that they sum to 14. And how do you remember this? <laughs> the way I remember it is because like pH, the middle is 7, right? So like probably at the middle, you got pOH and pH are the same, right? So 7 and 7, so they sum to 14, right? If 7 is the midpoint, right? <laughs> like you probably had a sum to 14 and it, it like goes between 0 and 14. So we got 14. So essentially, in order to do this unit well, you have to be very comfortable between flipping between all of these things, right? Because you basically use pH a ton, you use like you might be given the hydrogen ion concentration and you need to be able to find all of these numbers. So let's just do a couple examples. It's not too complicated, but basically you could take your 10 to the negative five, right? We take this, we get the positive of the exponent to get our pH is equal to five, right? This is hydrogen ion concentration. Now, essentially we can find pOH just using these equations. And now these are the only three equations you're ever gonna have to know for like pOH and pH, right? So essentially if you have five, you could do pOH gives you nine, right, 14 minus 5, and then basically you can plug it in here, right? So essentially, if to get from H plus to pH, you take the exponent and neg negate it, then for this one, you negate it and put it as the exponent, right? So essentially, our OH minus is going to be, take this, put it negative 9, and then we put a 10 there, and we are good. All right, very nice. So now we know what pH is, we know what pOH is, very cool stuff. So now let's do a little bit more of a practical like example because usually AP Chem is mean and they decide not to give you like the actual like hydrogen ion concentration right off the bat. So we got to do a couple more mean examples, right? So let us say, let us say that we have 2.0 moles of H2SO4, right? In like, I don't know, 1.5 liters of water, right? So furic acid is a very strong acid. So we don't have to worry about any like weak acid nonsense. We'll talk about that later, but this is a strong acid. So essentially what a strong acid does is it spits out all its H pluses. So essentially because there's a two here, we call it di product, okay, right? Two, di, di means two. So that's why it's di product. Guess what? Like, I don't know, HNO3 would be called. What is one in Greek? <laughs> Testing your Latin roots knowledge, let's go. 
Well, essentially, this is just going to be monoprotic, right? Mono means one, so that's why it's called monoprotic. But we don't care about landon, okay? Landon is kind of irrelevant, <laughs> bruh. But, like, what we actually care about is what it means, right? So, essentially, if there are two hydrogens, that means that for every H2SO4 molecule, you're actually going to get two of them. Dude, it's like a two-for-one special. It's kind of epic. So, essentially, when we put this acid in the water, it actually becomes 4.0 moles of hydrogen, right? Because, essentially, we start with, like, two moles of H2SO4, right? And then this goes into 2H2 plus a SO4 2 minus, right? So essentially, if you have 2.0 here, and all of them co get converted here, then essentially you had to take one time, you had to multiply it by two, right? So now we have 4.0 moles of hydrogen, like hydrogen ions, I don't know why I had a two there, that's wrong, okay. Well actually, let's just make this a little bit bigger because we need a smaller number to make this nice. So let's just do like, I don't know, um, like, I don't know, let's say like 10 liters, 10 liters of water, okay. So essentially, we have 4 moles of hydrogen ions in 10 liters of water. And remember, we're trying to look for hydrogen ion concentration, okay? We don't want the number of moles, we want the moles per liter, okay? So essentially, whenever you're doing this, you have to make sure you get to moles per liter. So essentially, if we have 4.0 moles, we just divide by liters to get 4.0 moles per liters over 10. So if we want moles per liter, we just take our moles and we divide by liters. Makes sense over 10 liters, and we get the um, 0 0.4 uh, molarity, right? And now, if we want to find the pH of the solution, all we got to do is plug it into our epic equation, negative log of hydrogen ion concentration, which is equal to negative log of 0 0.4, which is equal to, let's see. Now, what I like to do before I actually, like, do the calculation is just check what you think it might be, right? So, essentially, this is between 1 and 0 0.1, right? We had to go by power of the 10. And 0 0.1 is 10 to the negative 1. So essentially, the pH should be between 0 and 1. Okay, let us check if we actually get something between 0 and 1, and then we should be good. So we do negative log of 0 0.4, whoops, that's not 0 0.4, and get 0 0.4 again. <laughs> I did not expect that, but you can see, right? Like, it's between 0 and 1, we were able to predict it. Very nice. We get our pH is equal to 0 0.4. Nice. Why don't we do it for something a bit harder? like a base, right? So essentially, let us say we have like 0 0.1 like moles of NaOH in, I don't know, let's say like 2 liters of water. Okay. So you can see there's only 1 OH in this molecule, so we don't have to worry about multiplying by 2 or anything fancy like that. So we can just chill, and we know that there is going to be 0 0.1 moles of OH- minus after it breaks apart in the water. Okay. So now we want to find the concentration, right? We don't like moles, okay? No one likes moles. Naked mole rats are disgusting, okay? So we actually have to find molarity, okay? And the way we do that, it'll be divided by 2 liters to get 0 0.05 moles per liter, okay? And now we have our concentration of OH-. And remember, our three equations, right? We had pH, pOH, and we had our uh, 14. And this is equal to negative log of H+, plus, negative log of OH-, minus and is equal to pH plus pOH. Okay, so which one of these equations has an OH minus in it? That is right, we got this one over here. So this is the one we're gonna use. We wanna take a negative log of this, and that is equal to negative log of 0 0.05. Let us find that out. Negative log of 0 0.05, and we get 1.3, okay. And now we have pOH, right? So now we could use this equation. We've already used this one, so we don't wanna use it again, right? We basically just look at the only other one we could use, right? The only one, the only the only thing we know are pOH and OH, and the only one that remains that has pOH is this one, so that's what we use next, right? So we do 14 minus 1.3, and we get 12.7. So now we have pH. Let's go. We got our answer. pH is equal to 12.7, as expected. It's in a basic solution, so it will obviously have greater than 7 pH. Dude, that's like another thing to check, okay? If you're putting an acid, there's no way you're going to get more than 7 pH. I'm sorry to break it to you, but you can't go basic after adding, like, gobs of acid, okay? <laughs> Dude, I've made that mistake more than once, but we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. Okay, now another question that you might get based on this, like, all of this stuff is based on just that basic pOH and pH equations, right? Like, those three equations, those are all you got to know to solve all kinds of problems, right? So here's another one that you can actually solve using those equations. So let us say that we have, like, 100 milliliters of, I don't know, let's say pH like 3 solution, right? And we add 900 milliliters of distilled water. And let's just say we want to find the pH of the final solution, right? 
So essentially, how do we find pH? We want to know the hydrogen ion concentration. And how do we get the hydrogen ion concentration if the liters are changing, right? Like, like concentration is moles over liters, and liters are changing. So how do we like find the actual pH? Now essentially, like you know what the final like volume of the container is, right? Like eventually, it's just gonna end up with one liter of solution, right? 100 milliliters plus 900 milliliters is equal to one liter. But in order to find pH, we actually had to know the hydrogen ion concentration. And essentially, when we add in distilled water, we're not adding in like many like H plus ions relative to this, right? So essentially, we just need to find the initial number of H plus ions, that's not going to change, and then we could divide it by the total volume, right? We want moles over liters. So let us calculate the original number of like moles of hydrogen ions, right? So pH 3, remember we take the negative and we put it like to the power of 10, right? So 10 to the negative 3 is our H plus ion concentration. Then essentially, the moles per liter in the initial solution, right, in this part. But we want to find the moles, right? Because we want to find moles over liters. So let us find the moles by multiplying by 100 milliliters, which is like 0.1 liters. And essentially we get that we have like, um, we have 10 to the negative four moles of hydrogen ions, right? So essentially we divide by one liter, we get 10 to the negative four moles per liter. And we take the negative of the exponent to get pH is equal to four. Hooray, we did it boys, very nice. <laughs> okay, because one definition of bases is not kind of fun enough, okay? We, we gotta have a little bit more fun with our definitions of bases. We now gonna talk about a new definition for acids and bases because Arrhenius's one was kind of troll. <laughs> it doesn't cover all cases, so let us talk about a, a different type. Bronson's Lowry, okay. The way I like to remember this is Arrhenius is like one name, kind of boring, you know, kind of simple. That's why it's the most basic. But then Bronson Lowry, that is such a cool name, okay? That's two names, in fact. Two is always greater than one, okay? So that's why this is a little bit more sophisticated, and that's why we're talking about it a second. So acids are considered exactly the same as the Arrhenius theory, so I guess not that sophisticated. So these guys basically give off these H plus ions. All right, makes sense, right? We, we, we don't have to worry too much about it, nothing too fancy here. But then, <laughs> when you get to the bases, it's kind of scary. Bases are not ones that give off OH minus ones. They're actually things that snatch H plus ones. Now this kind of makes sense, right? Like, if acids do one thing, you would probably expect bases to do the opposite. It kind of makes sense. Like, even in Arrhenius' definition, when you give off OH minuses, those guys go and eat up all the H pluses. So, basically, same thing. Alright, so why don't we look at what happens when we react a Bronson-Lowry acid with a Bronson-Lowry base. And these are called acid-base reactions. So, if we have NH3 plus HCl, that yields NH4 plus plus CL minus, I think. So let me ask you a very epic question. What is this guy? Is this guy an acid, a base, or a troll? <laughs> I don't know what the third option's for, but is he an acid or a base? Come on, you guys gotta tell me. Bro, why is nobody answering? This is so sad. I thought cameras could talk. But the answer is, actually, it is a base. Even though it has like three hydrogens, no one cares, okay? The only thing we care about is what it actually does. And you can see that it goes from an NH3 to an NH4+. So clearly, it grabbed an H+, it went and snatched it from the CL-, minus. the CL- minus is all alone and scared now, but clearly, this guy is a base, because he is snatching an H+, from the CL-. minus. But essentially, if this guy is a base, then this guy has to be an acid, right? Because essentially, like, this guy is giving off, or this guy is grabbing an H+, then if we went the other way, this guy would have to give off an H+. So in fact, this is called the conjugate acid, and this is called a conjugate base. So essentially, once you have these bronsted lowry acids and the bases, they basically have conjugate pairs. And all that means is that like they're on opposite sides of the reaction. One has the hydrogen, and one doesn't have the hydrogen. And the one with the hydrogen is the acid. Makes sense. The reason why the one with the hydrogen is the acid is because acids give off H+. That's the one thing you gotta know. Acids give off H+. And that's why this guy is gonna be the conjugate acid, this guy's gonna be the conjugate base. Now what's cool about water, <laughs> water is kind of a troll. I, like, I know I kind of added that option in as a joke, but water is actually neither, okay? It's neither an acid or a base, right? Like, for example, if you react NH3 with, like, water, it essentially becomes, like, NH4 plus plus OH minus. And essentially, in this case, the water is actually acting as an acid, right? It's giving off its H plus and becoming an OH minus. So in this case, water is acting as an acid, right? But what happens if we had, like, I don't know, what happens if we had like HCl plus uh, H2O yields like um, Cl minus plus H3O plus. So in this case, the water is actually gaining a proton, right? So in this case, it's acting as a base. 
So water is something called amphoteric, and like, it's kind of a useless term, I don't think they'll care too much about it, but ampho means like both, like amphibian is like both land and water, that's why amphoteric means that it's both acid and a base, makes sense. Honestly, like water is the only thing that's acid and a base because literally it's H and OH minus. Like it's literally made of the two things combined. So it kind of makes sense that it's both an acid and a base. All right, so now we got to talk about the difference between strong acids and strong bases and weak acids and weak bases. So we saw like with H2SO4, that's an example of a strong acid. We saw that two moles of sulfuric acid went in and we know immediately that four moles of H plus are going to go out, right? Like every single one of those hydrogen atoms gets like expelled like these acids do not like their hydrogens at all. A weak acid on the other hand like HC2, um, H3O2, very fun trivia question what is this boy, that's right acetic acid. This guy's a weak acid right, like if you put in one mole of acetic acid you actually don't get one mole of hydrogen ions like separated from the acetic acid. Some of the acetic acid will stay together with its hydrogen because it loves it so much and only a little bit will actually end up like coming out into the solution. And that makes sense, right? A stronger acid should give off more hydrogen, right? So essentially, all the strong acids give off their hydrogen fully, there's none left of the original acid. So let's just give a couple more examples of strong and weak acids. So it's pretty important to remember these, right? Because on the test, they're not going to tell you whether it's strong or weak, right? They're only going to tell you, here's the acid, find the pH of the solution. So H2SO4 is one, HNO3 is one, like HClO4 is one, HClO3 is also one. And essentially, there's also hickel hipper high. That's what my like chemistry teacher taught me. I think it works perfectly, but hickel hipper and high. And these are all strong. And then essentially, all the other ones are going to be weak. <laughs> Dude, my chemistry teacher gave me the best way to remember this in the universe. Basically, if there are two more oxygens than hydrogens, it's probably going to be a strong acid. Now, I don't know how true this is, but I've used that rule like <laughs> as a guideline for everything, and it worked perfectly, okay? Like, there's probably some exception to the rule, but like in all the examples that come up on AP Chem test, as long as you just have like two more oxygens and hydrogens, it is for sure a strong acid. Like you see, right? Three and one, that's for sure two more. You got four and one, that is three more. Holy moly, that is crazy. You got three and one, that is two more. So these are all strong. And then you just got your hickel hipper high. Didn't know you're forgetting that, dude. Hickel hipper high. Holy moly, that's such a good, <laughs> such a good mnemonic. Holy. A couple more examples of weak acids, but like, as long as you know the strong acids, you should be good, right? You could probably say that, oh, it's not a strong acid, so it's probably weak. There's like HF, there's NH4+, plus, there's a couple more, but honestly, you don't have to worry about it too much, okay? Just remember these strong acids and you're good. Now let us talk about bases, right? So essentially for this one, we kind of need a periodic table, so let me get that up. Dude, ptable.com is the best, okay? You, you gotta use ptable.com. If you don't use ptable.com, that's just kind of sad, but essentially, um, Bases pair with like these kind of guys, right? So essentially, like for example, Na, you got NaOH, Li, you got LiOH, and then because like we got Ca, which is 2 plus, that's why it's CaOH2, right? So essentially, just visually, all of these guys are strong bases, and then like these three guys are strong bases. So essentially, there's like this B over here, and that's how you find all the strong bases. All right, so these are all the strong bases that you had to know. Just remember that it shows up as a B over here. That's all you got to know. Some weak bases you got like NH3, that's like the only example I know, but like basically if it's not a strong base, it's probably going to be a weak base. Now I don't know how relevant this is honestly, but basically you could kind of predict how acidic things are going to be. So let's just explain how to predict it just in case like you guys want to know and so you guys could probably derive some of these yourself. But essentially like let's just look at like HF and HCl. So HF is a weak acid, right? But HCl is a very strong one. So what is the difference? Well, essentially, fluorine is way smaller, right? So it's basically grabbing really, really tight onto that hydrogen. And we know that acids are the ones that let their hydrogens go, right? Like really strong acids just let all their hydrogens go. They don't get, like, they don't care. <laughs> but then the weak acids, they hold on to their H+, right? So essentially, the reason why they're not as strong is because they don't release as much H+, as their strong counterpart. And that makes sense, right? If chlorine is smaller, then it's going to keep its hydrogen, and chlorine is bigger, so it's actually going to be, like, more likely to give off its hydrogen. And if we look at like HBr and HI, HBr is actually stronger of an acid than HCl because HBr is even bigger, right? So it's even more likely to give off its H, like H plus ion. And then HI is literally the strongest one out of all of these because it has like a really, really big iodine atom that's just like, I don't care about any of you guys, just see you later, see you later, I don't care. So essentially, bigger atom slash less hoggy 
equals a better acid. Very, very important stuff. Okay. And also you could think about it this way, like the HF bond is really, really strong, right? It's like the, it has higher bond energy. And like as your bond en energy decreases, like you're more likely to give off the H plus, right? Because it's really easy to break that bond. So this has the highest bond energy and the lowest. Okay, moving on, let us talk about the next thing. Okay, so, so far we've only been talking about how to do calculations related to, like, strong acids and strong bases. Let us talk about, like, weak stuff now. And the first thing we gotta talk about is water itself. So, water itself is kind of like a very weak acid slash base kind of thing, right? Like, water actually dissociates into H plus and OH minus, right? So, it's like kind of both. So, essentially, we can kind of think about this as an equilibrium kind of thing. So, essentially, like, this is a liquid... This is aqueous, this is aqueous, and how do you find equilibrium coefficients, right, like the constant? You basically just take the aqueous ones, right, you multiply them together, the product side first, and you divide by the aqueous stuff on the left side, but there's no aqueous stuff on the left side because water is liquid. So essentially, this is the, like, this is what the equilibrium constant of this reaction is. And technically I should probably put a double arrow because it's going both ways, but essentially, this is the equilibrium constant for water, okay, and it's called Kw. Now, does anybody have a guess? <laughs> does anybody have a guess what, is, what Kw is equal to at standard temperature? Hint, hint, we got pH plus pOH is equal to 14. <laughs> what do you guys think? So essentially, like, you know that, like, if you have uh, H plus ion concentration of 10 to the negative 5, then your pH is going to be 5, right? Which means that your pOH is going to be 9, which means that your HOH minus concentration is going to be equal to 10 to the negative 9, right? What happens if your H plus ion concentration is like, I don't know, 10 to the negative 7, right? Neutral. Then your pH is 7, your pOH is 7, and then your OH minus is also going to be 10 to the negative 7. So what is your equilibrium constant? That is right. You can see that no matter when, like what you do, no matter what your H plus ion concentration is, it always multiplies to... 10 to the negative 14. So essentially this like the like this value for the equilibrium constant is actually what proves this equation. So essentially they calculated like okay we're gonna have like this equilibrium and a bunch of different like H plus and OH minus concentrations and then they found that it was 10 to the negative 14 which is why you have pH plus pOH is equal to 14. Now why is this relevant? The reason why it's relevant is because this is only true at 25 degrees Celsius right? The definition of neutral, like neutral, we usually think of as like pH is equal to 7. But actually what it means is that H plus and OH minus concentrations are equal, which at like 25 degrees Celsius is when pH is equal to 7. But what happens if our Kw actually became like 10 to the negative 13? Then in that case, neutral pH would actually be 6.5, right? So essentially like the pH of neutral could change, but as long as you have an equal number of hydrogen and like hydroxide ions, that's when you have neutrality. So the key takeaway from this thing is that like neutrality is OH minus the concentration is equal to H plus, right? And that's, and then like the same thing for acidic and basic, OH minus is greater than H plus for basic dudes. Now this is pretty logical, right? It makes sense, but just keep in mind that they might try to troll you, and if they say like Kw is not equal to 10 to the negative 14, then you might actually have to use this definition, right? This definition works all the time. So I would just recommend using this definition, like it's pretty straightforward when pH 7 is neutral, but like just use this definition, it's a lot like, it, it works every single time. Okay, so that was with water. Why don't we do this epic equilibrium strat with like, I don't know, let's just do with an acid or something. So for a weak acid, we basically got like HA, where A is just some random atom, yields like H plus plus A minus, right? Like it's essentially giving off an H plus. Now we know for a strong acid, there's no equilibrium here, right? Like all of it is just going this way. No one cares. It's not going to take back its H plus. It doesn't care anymore. But for a weak acid, it's actually going both ways, right? Like some of it wants to keep holding on to their H plus. Some of it wants to just give it away. This is aqueous and this is aqueous. All of these are aqueous. So essentially, we could write our K of the acid is equal to H plus times A minus over uh, HA, right? We're just taking the product of the aqueous stuff on the right side and dividing it by the aqueous stuff on the left side and we get an epic equation, right? So now the reason why this is useful is we could actually use this to say how strong an acid is, right? Like, the bigger this like value is, that means there's more hydrogen atoms relative to how many like 
of the initial atom there is, right? Like, if there's more H plus relative to the acid, that means there's a stronger acid, right? So essentially, we could use the Ka of an acid to determine how strong it is. And then also, like, you could just do pKa, right? Like, P, you could just think of as taking the negative log, right? That's what you do for OH, that's what you do with, for H+. Plus. So if you want to do pKa, you take negative log of the Ka. All right, so this Ka is called the acid dissociation constant, right? It's how much of the acid actually ends up dissociating. The more it is, the more acid dissociates. The less it is, the less the acid dissociates. Okay, so before we get into an example of how to use that equation, let us talk about the base side of it, right? So essentially we have like, I don't know, we have AOH yields A plus OH minus. A plus plus OH minus, and we can write our equation. KB, the base dissociation constant, is equal to A plus plus OH minus uh, times OH minus over AOH. And then PKA is the same, uh, PKB is the same thing, so it is going to be like negative log of KB. Okay, pretty straightforward. Let us use it to determine some pHs. So let us say that we have a 0.5 molar solution of like, I don't know, HNO2, which is nitrous acid, and this is a weak acid, right? There's only one more oxygen than hydrogen, and we need two more oxygen than hydrogen for it to be a strong acid. And the Ka for nitrous acid is equal to four times 10 to the negative four. Okay. So essentially, like in my previous like equilibrium video, I completely forgot to talk about ice charts. But now we could actually use ice charts and I will explain how they work. But like honestly speaking, I don't really like ice charts and I'll tell you why. But let's just get into it, okay? So if we write out the equation, we basically have HNO2 yields H plus plus NO2 minus. Okay. Now essentially what an ice chart does is it basically takes your initial concentration, right? You start with 0.5 moles, uh, molar molarity of nitrous acid and you start with zero of the other stuff, right? Now the change is actually different, right? So like S moles of this guy, you actually had to add S moles of each of these, right? Because for each one of these that is consumed, it makes one of each of the other ones, right? So essentially, if we do minus S here, we had to do plus S over here and over here. So then we basically get that our equilibrium state is gonna have 0.5 minus S, S, and S. And essentially at equilibrium, the that like quotient we had, the like, uh, NO2 minus times H plus over HNO2, this has to equal our Ka at the equilibrium, right? That's the definition of the equilibrium constant. So essentially, we could plug in, right? We could plug in our values, right? We have our initial, we have our change, we have our equilibrium concentration, right? So at equilibrium, we want S times S over 0 0.5 uh, uh, minus S to equal 4 times 10 to the negative 4. Now, like, there's two ways to solve this. Basically, like, if, if S is tiny relative to 0 0.5, we don't really care, like, what exactly it is, right? So essentially, we just need to solve for S and see whether it's close, and if it's not close, then we can just assume that we ignore this part. Okay, so if we solve for it, we basically get, like, S squared over 0 0.5 is equal to 4 times 10 to the negative 4. So that means S squared is equal to 2 times 10 to the negative 4. Let us solve for S. Square root of 2 times 10 to the negative 4. Okay, so 0 0.01 is, like, basically like tiny compared to 0 0.5 right the technical rule is like five percent rule or something as long as it's five percent of the original you're good and you can see that it is only three percent of the original so we don't we could actually ignore it so so essentially our s is just equal to 0 0.014 so if our s is 0 0.014 that is equal like our s is also the like hydrogen ion concentration this is h plus is no2 minus right so our s is also the concentration of h plus ions right so essentially, we could use the concentration. If we got concentration, we know how to find pH. We just take the negative log of it. Negative log of 0 0.014. So essentially, we could take a negative log of 0 0.014. And we get like 1.85 at our pH. 1.85 pH, and we are done. Very nice. Okay, why don't we do an example with a base too, just to get it, <laughs> get it real good. Say we have 1.0 molar uh, solution of ammonia which has a Kb of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. Okay, so essentially our equation is NH3 um, yields, or NH3 plus H2O yields NH4 plus plus HOH minus, right? So essentially, this is the same thing as saying our, well, if we draw our ICE chart. Now, the reason why I don't like the ICE chart basically is because, like, it kind of just, like, makes you not understand what you're doing, right? Like you can just think about it this way, right? You start with 1.0, and 
if you consume S, we just like say S is how much actually goes through the reaction, right? That means there's S less here, and there is S more of the thing we want, right? Like S more of both of these. Like, I know the same thing as the ice chart, but you should just understand what it's doing so you don't actually have to write out the ice chart every single time. So essentially, S of it is going through the reaction, which means that S of it is getting consumed, and S of each of the products are getting produced. Makes sense. Okay. So essentially, we could say that S squared over 1.0 minus S is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. So if we uh, assume that S is negligible, we could solve for S squared, and we get of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5 is 0 0.004. 0 0.00, or S is equal to 0 0.00424. And now, if we just want to find the pH, remember that S is actually the OH minus concentration. So if we want to find the pOH, we would take like the um, negative log of this, and we get 2.37. Now remember, we're this is a base, okay? So we're not done yet. Remember to check your answers. Like if it's if you're getting like a tiny pH for a base, you you got something wrong, okay? So essentially, we know this actually should be the pOH. So we just do 14 minus that, and we get 11.6 out of our pH. Nice. Okay. pH is equal to 11.6. All right, very cool. Sorry I didn't explain this part very well, but like, but basically you just want the reaction quotient, right? NH4 plus times OH minus over NH3 to equal your equilibrium constant, right? Because that's the definition of the equilibrium constant. This should equal the equilibrium constant at equilibrium. Okay, so now one more thing we got to talk about before we talk about buffers are something called salts, right? And I've kind of touched on it before, but it's basically two ions getting put together. But salts could themselves be acids or bases. So the one thing that really helped me when understanding salts is that like when you have a conjugate acid and base, right? Let's say the acid is pretty strong. That basically means that the base is really weak. So essentially, conjugate acid and bases are opposite of each other, right? So if the acid is kind of strong, then the base is really weak. If the conjugate base is kind of strong, then the acid is really weak. So take for example, like the salt C2H3O2, um, like Na, right? So when you're trying to decide whether this is acidic or basic, what you want to do is you want to first break it up into the ions and figure out what they come from, right? So this is acetic acid, like this is the acetate ion, and that comes from acetic acid, right? So HC2H3O2. And then this guy comes from NaOH, right? So this guy is the conjugate acid of NaOH, and NaOH is really, really strong, right? So essentially, this guy is going to be a very weak acid. Very, very weak acid. I should probably put a very, very in all caps. There we go. Now, we know that this guy is a weak acid, which means that, like, this guy is also going to be pretty weak, but, like, still stronger than a very, very weak acid, right? So this guy is going to be a weak, um, weak base, but it's still stronger than this one, right? Because this is a very strong acid which means that this is a very weak acid, but this is only a weak base. So that, that basically means that overall, this ion or this salt is going to be actually basic. Because this one came from a weak acid, this one came from a strong base, but now we're taking the conjugates, right? So essentially it gets flipped, and that's why we now have a basic thing. So just to give you guys a couple more examples, right? Like we basically could have F and or NAF, right? So once again, we have something from a weak acid and something from a weak base. But because it's conjugate, we flip it, right? Like, because this comes from a strong base, you would expect this whole thing to be basic, right? But essentially, it's a conjugate of that, so we actually have to take the opposite, which is why this is actually acidic. Another example is like NH4Cl, right? HCl is a very strong acid, right? And this comes from a pretty weak base. So essentially, like, you would think it would be acidic because Cl comes from a strong acid, but it is a conjugate, remember? We're flipping it around. So now this actually is basic. So, like, basically, whenever you're thinking about it, just look at which one is comes from a strong thing, and then it's just the opposite of that, right? Like, this one comes from a strong acid, which is why it's basic. This one comes from a strong base, which is why it's acidic. Now, if both of them come from strong acids, like, it's just neutral, right? It doesn't do anything. And if, like, both of them come from weak, then you can't really tell, right? Because, like, there are different levels of weakness. So, let me just break it down for you guys. Comes from, and then dot dot dot, strong acid. It's actually basic, right? Because we're taking the conjugate. If it comes from a strong base, weak acid, it's actually acidic. If it comes from strong acid and strong base, then it's neutral because both of them are going to be really, really weak. And if it comes from a weak acid and weak base, 
then it's going to be, you don't have enough information to tell necessarily, but like, if, if they ask you for it, just say neutral, but like, you don't technically don't have enough information. Okay, so just remember this, this is all you got to know for salt, okay? And now finally, we get to talk about buffers, okay, very fun. <laughs> Dude, these ones suck so bad, I, I, I could barely remember how all this stuff worked. But basically, buffers are what they sound like, right? Essentially, they act as buffers to pH changes. So when you add a really strong acid, it actually won't change as much if there's a buffer inside. So that's kind of cool. Basically, the way it works is like, let's just say we have a HC2H3O2 and C2H3O2 Na. So essentially, like, this guy wants to dissociate into H plus and C2H3O2. But this guy already has to dissociate into C2H3O2, right? Because it's like an ionic compound, it automatically dissociates. So when you look at the equilibrium, right, H, uh, C2H3O2 gives you H plus and C2H3O2 minus. So the equilibrium, basically this guy is going to push the equilibrium left, right? Because you're adding more of this, now like more of this guy wants to get formed, right? Whenever you push up one side, it wants to even it out. So essentially, now you have like this big reservoir of acid, right? And essentially, if you were to add a base, the equilibrium would shift this way, right? And essentially, you can make more H plus on demand because you have a bunch of these guys, right? Or for example, let's just say you added in a acid, right? Then essentially, the acid would push the equilibrium more this way. And like the actual H plus ion concentration won't change that much because it's getting eaten up by the acetic acid. So essentially, no matter what you do, you're not actually going to change the pH by that much because this equilibrium will just shift in different directions. And essentially, that's created by having like the acid itself and a salt that gives you something called the common ion effect, right? You basically want to match this ion and this ion, and then it makes the equilibrium stable. Common ion effect. All that means is that when you add a common ion, it'll shift the equilibrium back this way, and that actually allows it to act as a buffer. So just an example of the common ion effect, let's just say we have one mole of like H3COOH and one mole of CH3COONA. Okay. Now essentially this guy has a Ka of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. And basically we could think about it this way, right? So essentially we know we start with like this many um, moles of CH3CO, right? So we start with one mole of this guy, right? And let's just say that S moles undergo the reaction, right? So we have a reaction CH3COOH yields H plus plus CH3COO minus, right? So if S moles undergo it, we're basically consuming one, like S of the moles of the one mole originally, we're at like creating S moles of H plus, and we are adding more moles of this one, right? S more moles of that. So essentially, if we want our um, if we want our quotient to equal our equilibrium constant, right? We have H plus times CH three, and this should equal to this at equilibrium. So essentially, we could say that S times one plus S over one minus S is equal to one point eight times ten to the negative five. Okay. So essentially, like we could basically ignore these, right? Because they're basically going to be tiny compared to the ones, right? So essentially we just get that S is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. In which case this is also going to be the like um, this is also going to be the concentration of the hydrogen ions, right? So now we can just find the pH at the negative log of that. Hey, very nice. We get 4.74. Hey, very good. Okay. Alright, nice. We did it, boys. Very nice. Okay. So now so now I'm just going to introduce one last thing we could talk about, and basically that is the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. <laughs> I kind of butchered that, bruh. <laughs> Pretend I know how to talk, okay? Pretend I know how to talk. And basically this just takes the equation that we wrote, and it makes it a lot simpler, okay? So instead of having to use ice charts, you can just use this, and you're basically done. So essentially we could derive this equation by saying that Ka is equal to H plus times A minus, where A minus is a conjugate base, over HA, right? Now essentially, if we take the log of this, right, we basically get that PKA is equal to log of um, HA over A minus plus, or sorry, minus log of H plus. And we know what log of H plus is, right? That's just going to be like pH. So essentially we get PKA, 
widget plus log of H A over A minus is equal to uh, pH, right? We just bring this over to that side. So basically we get that pKa plus log of A minus over H A is equal to pH. And that over here is a Henderson Hasselbalch equation. So essentially what we could have done last time, instead of like going through the whole ice chart, is we could have put in our pKa and then we would put our A minus and HA, which were both one molarity, right? So this would just be log one, which is equal to zero. So essentially we would just get that pKa is equal to pH, very nice. In our previous example, and then like obviously that makes sense, right? We just took negative log of 1.8 times 10 to the negative five. That's why it worked out so nicely. Interestingly enough, this is called the half equivalence point. That's basically when your A minus and HA plus are the same. All right, so now the last thing we got to do is talk about titration, right? Now, essentially for a strong acid and strong base, this is pretty easy, right? Because essentially what you're going to do is you're just going to keep adding base. Like let's just say you're trying to figure out the concentration of a strong acid, right? All you got to do is you got to add a base that you know the concentration of until the pH becomes seven. And then once you have that, then like all you got to do is you just like do some equations and figure it out, right? So let's just say we wanted to figure out like the concentration of HCl and we have like, I don't know, 0.1 molar NaOH, right? And let's just say we had, um, let's just say we had 200 milliliters of this, right? So essentially, if it takes 200 milliliters of NaOH in order to um, like neutralize this, then essentially the amount of H plus must have exactly cancels out with the number of OH minus, right? So basically when you're doing titrations, you basically want mole of H plus to equal mole of OH minus. And the mole of this, let's just say we ended up using 200 milliliters, right? Then essentially moles of NaOH is equal to 0 0.1 times 0 0.2, right? You got moles per liter, you multiply by 0.2 liters, okay? And then we know the moles of hydrogen here is equal to 200 milliliters or 0 0.2 liters times the concentration of HCl, right? Which is what we're trying to solve for. So essentially we just get that the concentration of HCl is equal to 0 0.1 molar. Okay, <laughs> that's an M, that is an M. What happens if, for example, this was H2SO4, right? Then in this case, we would have to take um, 0 0.2 liters and the concentration of H2SO4, right? But each concentration, like each mole of H2SO4 turns into two H2 uh, uh, H2 ions, right? So you have to actually multiply by two and you basically want um, and then this one stays the same, right? You basically have 0 0.2 times 0 0.1. And you get that your concentration of H2SO4 is equal to 0 0.05. Noise. Okay, so titration of strong acid, strong base is pretty easy, right? You just want to balance out the H plus and the OH on both sides, and then you're done. For a weak acid with a strong base, it's kind of hard, actually. Weak acid, strong base. For a strong acid, strong base, your curve kind of looks like this, right? Because essentially, like, or originally is mostly the acid, and then once you get to the base, it'll just go like that, right? Once you get more of the base, it'll start going opposite direction. Okay. But for a weak acid, strong base, it actually looks something like this. So over here, like, the weak acid actually acts like a buffer, which is why it actually st starts going pretty strongly, and then it starts, like, leveling off, because it actually is becoming a buffer. So let us talk about how to deal with that. So let's just say we have like, I don't know, 0 0.5 molar like HNO2, right? Which has a Ka of four times 10 to the negative four. And we are adding in like, I don't know, 0 0.05 moles of NaOH, right? So essentially what the NaOH does is it completely like converts some of this um, like HNO2 into its conjugate um, base, right? So essentially, um, 0 0.5, so let's just say there's like one liter of this, right? Then essentially we start with 0 0.5 moles of HNO2, right? Then when it reacts with 0 0.05 moles of NaOH, then it becomes 0 0.45 moles of um, HNO2 and 0 0.05 moles of NO2 minus, right? So essentially now we can actually apply Henderson-Hasselbalch, right? Because we have a 
uh, we have an acid, we have its conjugate base, and we could say pKa plus log of 0 0.05 over 0 0.45 is equal to pH. And we can just calculate this. Negative log of um, 4 times 10 to the negative 4 plus um, log of 0 0.05 over 0 0.45. And hooray, we get a pH of 2.44. Like essentially, you could see how this changed it, right? Like if we only if we had like 0 0.05 moles of NaOH without the buffer, then essentially we would have a concentration of 0 0.05 negative log of 0 0.05. We would have got a pH of 1.3. So essentially, this buffer is basically changing the um is preventing the pH from going too high. Or sorry, yeah, yeah. Oh no, wait, what? <laughs> no, no, it would it was like 14 minus this. Okay. Yeah, so basically you would have like such a high pH if it was not for this buffer. Okay, so you basically get the idea, right? So um, the one thing you want to remember when you're doing weak acid plus a strong base is that you like when the strong base is added, it converts some of the acid to its conjugate base, right? And then you could apply Henderson Hasselbalch. Basically at the beginning, you use Henderson Hasselbalch, but once your strong base converts all the weak acid to its conjugate base, then you could just like ignore the weak acid, right? Because now it's all the strong base, and then you could just do it as a normal titration. Okay. Well, I hope that was helpful. I'm kind of rusty at AP Chem, so I'm sorry if that was not the most coherent explanation possible. I'm sorry, but I hope it was helpful. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe for more. Thank you guys for watching again. Comment down below what else you guys want to see, but other than that, I'm done. So, thank you guys for watching again, and see you guys next time. Good luck on the AP.